This is a first gen Dodge Viper. It's one of the most iconic sports cars ever. And it is absolutely terrifying to drive and impractical to own. We're gonna talk about this Viper and a bunch of other cars that seem great on paper, but are actually not so great to own. I'm James, he's Justin. Let's talk about cars. Welcome to Donut. Justin, you're an eight year old kid, okay? You see a Dodge Viper rolling down the street. What are you thinking? <laughs> oh, the Viper! Oh my God! Dodge released the Viper in 1991, and it's basically a street legal race car. It has a V10 that makes over 400 horsepower, a six speed manual transmission. It only weighs about 3,000 pounds. It blew people's minds when it came out. But here's the thing about race cars. They don't have anti-lock brakes, neither does the Viper. They don't have traction control, neither does the Viper. Race cars don't have airbags. A V10 with no traction control and no airbags is very scary. These cars need your absolute undivided attention to keep straight. It also doesn't have a lot of things that regular cars have, like windows. Instead, it has these vinyl zippers that you have to undo to open the door because it doesn't even have no door handles neither. And driving down the road somehow, you still weren't free from danger, even after you get home because the side exhaust is famous for burning your ankles. All right, so Justin, if you were to own this car, is it a sweet dream or a beautiful nightmare? If anyone has driven a 90s sports car. They were all built plastic and like used truck parts. Yeah. So they all feel really specific. Jimmy yeah, yeah. described it as uh, feeling like a McDonald's playground. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a track toy. Mm -hmm. I, I would own it as a track toy because I imagine it breaks every time you take it out, so. Beautiful nightmare. Beautiful nightmare. Beautiful this one nightmare. smells like coolant. This car is the reason that we made this video. Well, the Viper's engine was actually derived from a Lamborghini engine because Chrysler owned Lamborghini at the time, which makes a perfect pro-level transition to another supercar. I'm talking about the Lamborghini Machine Tune T. Tune Tosh is designed to look cool, but ergonomically, it's extremely impractical. Getting in and out of the car means contorting your body around the scissor doors. The visibility mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Nope. This is what the rear window looks like. It has that half window that goes down, which just looks like a nightmare because uh, it's just like a four piece little thing. I couldn't imagine. And then the door handle's like a metal dowel button that yeah. you just push up. It's like, what's the security in this thing? <laughs> like how expensive that car is, you just press a button. To back up, you have to open the door and look out of it. Because because of the unique design, the gas and brake pedals were offset, meaning that you had to sit almost sideways while driving. A lot of owners reported getting intense back pain from just driving the Countach because of this. Plus, there's the whole issue of reliability. During much of the intense 16-year production run, the company experienced money problems constantly. Interior parts would break off, AC units basically never worked, and even though like they've used basically that engine since the Mira, they didn't figure out how to make it reliable. But every dollar that you you paid for in maintenance and repairs was paid back tenfold in rubberneckers, looky loos, and fans. Justin, when you were a kid, what did you think about the Lamborghini Countach? They were so cool! Their wings and vents. It looks like a spaceship when you're a kid. Yeah, beautiful nightmare for sure. Uh, if I had that kind of money, I would probably do something else with it. So, I totally would, you know. Lamborghini Countach, beautiful nightmare. From the 80s supercar that everyone wanted to the 90s supercar that everyone wanted. Next up on the list, probably my favorite car of all time, the McLaren F1. The McLaren F1 debuted in 1992 as the fastest production car in the world, a title that it would hold for the next 10 wow. years. Back then, it cost the equivalent of about $1.2 million today, but that pales in comparison to what owners shelled out just for basic maintenance. Uh -oh. The upkeep is more insane than I would have ever imagined. The uh, bespoke clutch uh, needs to be replaced every two to 3,000 miles. A tire change costs $50,000. That's as much as a new Civic Type R. It's so expensive because in order to put the tires on, McLaren requires the owner to rent a private racetrack and hire a driver to work with the engineering team and get the tires and suspension dialed in. Why? 
because it's a beautiful work of art, Justin. When I was on Jay Leno's garage, they, the producer called me and he was like, we're gonna put you in the dream cars episode. Is there anything in Jay's collection that you'd wanna drive? And I was like, McLaren and F1. And they were like, okay, we'll call you back. And they called me back and they go, uh, yeah, actually we're gonna put you in a dream on a budget <laughs> uh, episode. <laughs> so you're gonna drive a Toyota MR2. Now, whether you drive it or if you just keep it in your garage, you still need to replace the fuel cell every five years. That costs $100,000. That's almost as much as a Porsche take in. Every significant part on the car has an expiration. God, is that a nightmare? Like that's like, your whole life's worth of money. So yeah, I think McLaren F1 is gonna remain a beautiful nightmare for me. If you were a big baller in the 90s but you couldn't afford a McLaren, chances are you may have purchased something like a Mercedes. Mm. Is this one gonna make me sick, Joe? I own one of these. <laughs> <laughs> This is one of the best eras of Mercedes, and a lot of them held up very well. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> During this time period, a government mandate led Mercedes to use a biodegradable wiring harness to offset the environmental impact that car manufacturing has. Let me say it again. A biodegradable wiring harness. Big fluctuations in cold, and heat and dryness make it worse. <laughs> the things you have to deal with to live on planet Earth. <laughs> yeah. If you bought a brand new SL320 in 1996, you would have paid the equivalent of nearly $150,000 in today's world. Woo! Yeah. What? Yeah, because today you can buy one of those under yeah. 10 grand. <laughs> like a very under. It's a 100% beautiful nightmare. This is why LS swapping is so popular. <laughs> People LS swap these now just to make them better. Yeah. Or better. Wow, dude. Interesting take. Reliable. <laughs> <laughs> if you own this next car, you must be a real glutton for punishment. I should know because I own two. I'm of course talking about the Bugatti Chiron. It's no secret that owning a Bugatti is expensive, okay? To change the oil in your Bugatti, you have to send it to one of only 10 guys that are responsible for servicing all the Bugattis around the world. Just that alone costs $25,000. Uh, what if you just need wiper blades? 3,800 bucks. Annual engine tune-up, $29,000. Just like the McLaren, the most egregious maintenance cost is replacing the wheels and tires because Bugatti recommends you buy new wheels every three tire changes. Just the wheels alone are $50,000. Oh my God, I yeah. guess they don't recommend aftermarket wheels. <laughs> Dude, a, like a Bugatti Chiron on Volks. Yeah. <laughs> the tires are Michelin Pilot Sport PAX tires that combine rubber and polyurethane and function like a run flat tire and a set of them costs $42,000 making a grand total $92,000. That's a BMW M4. But don't worry, because you can bundle all these surfaces together for only $100,000 every 14 months. Jeremiah actually did a B2B on that tire change, so uh, go check that out. Uh, this one, actually compared to a lot of the other ones, seems relatively practical. <laughs> I, I know that, that $100,000 14-month deal, yeah, it's so, a package deal, yeah. and they take care of everything. If they're willing to give you a package deal, and I have that kind of money, that's, that's a sweet dream. Yeah. That is, that is a, a sweet, sweet dream. dream. I agree. We only have two cars left on this list, and this next one can be a real nightmare to own. I'm talking about Shelby Cobra 427. Oh boy. We all know the story of this car. It's based on a British roadster called the AC Ace Bristol, but Carol Shelby thought it needed a little bit more power, baby. So uh, he turned it into a big, bad, American V8 death machine. The toughest dog Cobra came with the 427 cubic inch V8 and spit out 425 horsepower in the 1960s in a car that didn't have seatbelts. <laughs> While it's known for being an insanely good car at going fast, it isn't exactly the most pleasant vehicle to drive at low speeds and it's terrifying at high speeds. It sounds really familiar. Oh, that's weird because 
the same guy uh, worked on both of them. Carroll Shelby designed cars for people who could really, really, really drive. More people have more money than skill to drive, right. so. Some of the bigger problems come down the line in ownership. Over time, the aluminum body can become fatigued and a lot of the original cars have stress tears. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand like why aluminum is so tedious. It becomes like paper after a while. Like, you know, heat from the engine just turns it into rubber, essentially. That's why they built these out of plastic. So if you're in the market for a Shelby Cobra, make sure you look it over really closely before dropping like $5.5 million on it. So Justin, sweet dream or beautiful nightmare? Honestly, I say I say beautiful nightmare for that much money. Just build a kit car. I would build a kit car. Yeah, just build yeah. a kit car. Yeah. The kit car is way more worth it. Leave it in the dreams. Beautiful nightmare. Beautiful nightmare. For a real one, beautiful nightmare, yeah. but a, a, a kit, kit car? car? Yeah, let's Sweet go. Dream, Sweet yeah. dream. Hell yeah. There's Shelby Cobra Rich, then there's Alien Rich. Alien? Where you're so rich that everything in your everyday life would make you seem like an alien to a normal person, but it's just normal to you. Oh, uh, the Facebook guy. Yeah, the <laughs> Facebook guy. Justin, what do you know about a little company called Pagani? Oh. So Mercedes engine and a completely hand-built car, right? Pagani's are dope. Yeah, I've driven a Huayra. You uh, drove one? Our production insurance wouldn't cover it. So we had to call Pagani and talk to his son. And his son was like, yeah, he can drive it, we'll insure it. I've never snapped so many necks. Like I was driving in Huntington Beach and like entire restaurants would just be like, it was insane. I, it, we drew a crowd. The amount of attention that this thing gets is mind blowing. But this final car isn't a Waira. This is a cooler car than a Waira. It is a Bacani Kodolunga. I don't even know what that it's is. Like, Holy yeah. Is that newer? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, no wonder I don't know what it is. Yeah. All right. Wow, that's sick. That yeah, actually looks great. Sick. That reminds me of McLaren. It looks like an F1. The Kodolunga, it's kind of based on the Waira. And they're only making five of them, and they're all sold already. Naturally. The reason that this car is inconvenient is because it costs $7.4 million, and I don't have that much money. <laughs> Thank you for watching this video and everything else on Donut. Uh, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell to make sure you don't miss anything. Follow Justin at... Justin Free Man. Follow me at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut at Donut Media. I have a podcast called Pass Gas. It's the number 59 most popular comedy podcast in the world. Uh, go to donutmedia.com if you want to buy any of our clothes. Real sweated it. They're <laughs> not the sweated ones. Those are extra. <laughs>